Hi, my name is Richard Bilderbeek. Today I'm going to talk about doing test-driven development using Python. And this will be the schedule what we're going to do. First I'm going to create a GitHub repository to store, upload and version control our code. Then I'm going to develop a very trivial function, but there are still some things that may be more interesting than you would expect initially. And then we're going to take a look at the commit history and especially um, the order of things that you can really see the test driven development cycles in them. So you can see it back. So to recap, this is the test driven development cycle. You start here at red. When you're in the red phase, you're going to write a test that breaks the code. The test should fail. Then in the green phase, you're going to make it pass and you're going to fix it. In the blue phase, you're going to refactor it or you're going to rewrite it, you clean it up a bit. I'm used to push the code to the GitHub repository online and then I'm going to break the code again. And I'll be doing this exemplary. I won't focus much on the Python code and explain much Python. I'm going to take three, four, five cycles um, to do this and then we're going to view the, the commit history. So let's first create the GitHub repository. So um, I'm already logged into GitHub going to make a new repository. I'm going to call it is0. Brilliant name. Is0. Um, description. Python is0. Function. It doesn't need to be fancy for me now. I'm going to add a readme that saves me uh, to do some things with initializing. It's, it's easier. I'm going to ignore some temporary Python files. You don't need to do that. Uh, I do use the GPL 3.0 license because my code is public. And there is my repository. Most of the things I just did are optional, but I like to have a readme here. Um, so now I have a GitHub repository, that's great. I'm going to clone it. That means I'm going to bring it to my local computer. And I copy the URL here, but you can also just go type it or copy and paste it from there. I'm going to do git clone and that repository. Nice. I go into that folder is zero and here is the content of my repository on my hard disk. Note there's no file, there's no Python file yet. I'm going to add that now. And for that I'm going to use Visual Studio Code uh, because it's my favorite Python editor. It doesn't matter which editor you use, uh, I just use this one. So we're going to create a new file, we're going to create a new Python file. Uh, we're going to save it in my repository, uh, which is called is0. And the Python file itself, I'm also going to call it is0. So now I have a file called is0, I'm going to ignore this, uh, which is empty. And now, just taking a look at the schedule, we've just created our Git repository, we've cloned our code and we can now work on it. Now we can, we can develop is0 in Python, um, and I'm trying to take all the steps in an exemplary way. All right. So here we have our code, uh, it does nothing. First step, I'm going to break it. Assert. And my favorite way to break it at first, the order is unimportant. Test-driven development, you can just break your code in any way you want. I like this way of breaking it first. Which means I'm going to assume that is0 has documentation. So I press, um, so I'm going to start debug mode now uh, by pressing a 5 in this editor. And here we see that there's an error, is0 is not defined. So I just broke the code. So now in the green phase. Now I'm going to do minimally wor minimal work um, to fix the code. And I'm not with minimal work, I mean don't do fancy stuff, uh, but do try to fix it. So to fix it I need to add documentation. So I'm going to do that. It's a good idea to write your documentation first because in that way you think about what your function is going to do uh, in your own language or in English and not falling into technical details. So um, this function determines if the input is zero. It will return true if the input is a number that is zero. It will return false if the input is a number that is not zero. It will raise a type error if the input is not a number. So here I describe the function um, and I'm going to test if this is all true. 
But I'm still in the green phase, um, so I try to fix my code now. So I press debug now, and let's see, this all passed. So I made my first iteration. I'm gonna push my code now online. It's the blue phase, so I just broke it. I asked for documentation. I wrote the documentation, and now I'm gonna either refactor the code or push it. So I'm gonna push it uh, because I don't feel refactoring is needed. Git commit is zero has documentation. So with git push, maybe you have to type your password there. Um, I set the git up in such a way that I don't need to do. We can take a look at our repository. If I refresh this page, you see I just committed that is zero has documentation. I can click on it and see it. Let's do it. Um, you see that I've added the code here. All right, next step in the test-driven development cycle is to again break the code, fix it, upload it. So let's say, let's make it, let's break it in a way. Well, I would say that is zero with the input of zero should be true. So if you write this, you can't do that. Technically it's correct, but this is the same thing and it's more the recommended way. So I press debugging now or run it in debug mode. And indeed, bam, we have an exception here. Um, so we're going to fix that, we're going to fix that. Um, so I stop editing mode, uh, debug mode, and I'm going to type something like return x equals zero. Um, so now I'm in the green, I'm, I try to fix it, I press F5 again to, to start debug mode, and this all works great. So I just fixed the code, that means I'm in the blue phase, now the refactor phase, or the upload phase, or the whatever phase. Um, so we're going to add uh, commit push is zero detects returns true returns true if the input is zero and git push so now my team knows that I did a good job they can see it's a tiny commit I just fit the one test I've done one cycle and there it is and we can if you click on it we can see the changes that I made uh, nice. Now it's time to break the code again. So we could, for example, do assert not is 0 42. So maybe that will break the code. So I'm just going to run it again and see what happens. In this case, the code behaved exactly as expected, but I did not break the code. So if you're very formal, you should delete this test. And I do that. Um, sometimes you want to keep those tests anyway, just to make super sure and, um, well, for f more for documenting purposes. But I will throw it away here because that is the recommendation. So what I want to do now instead, if, that if, if the type of the input is incorrect, I am a string, that uh, a type error is raised. So it gives, should give some feedback to the user, like, hey, you are abusing this function. Like, is zero needs to signal it is abused, it's not used correctly. And for example, if putting a string into the function is zero, it should raise an error. So we need to write a test for that, and that's a bit, you need a bit more scaffolding because we don't use a testing framework here. So we're gonna, um, I'm just gonna show you. So there will be a Boolean, it's called has raised. And then um, at the start it's false, and at the end we're gonna assert that has raised. It's true. So this thing, um, yeah, uh, has raised is should be equal to true. If you wanna do it like this, but you can show the, that to this. So we need to write uh, some kind of code in between that is zero when it raises an error. That has that the boolean variable has raised uh, is set to true. So I'm going to write this scaffolding now. Um, it uses a try and accept thing has raised equals true. All right, this will already work. Um, it is better to also put a type error uh, to to specify the type here. So if you use a, a lint tool like rough or black or whatever. Um, it will complain if you only use accept, and that's why I put type errors in here, because all the linters will recommend you to do that. Um, on the other hand, uh, yeah, 
So I should break the code. Let's take a look if I have break the code. Now, of course, it assumes that my test is correct. So you need to fiddle around a bit with that. But I broke the code in exactly the way I wanted it. Has raised should be true here because a type error should be raised. It's not. That means it will have remained false. So that means assert for has raised. That should have been true. It breaks here. So it breaks at the right spot. Um, so I stop debugging now and I'm in the red phase. So I'm gonna fix. Uh, no, I broke the code. So I'm in the green phase now. Um, now I'm gonna fix this. If not is instance if x is not of type int then raise type error x must be of type int right so this i hope this fixes it let's take a look so i press debug now uh, let's take a look if we get through it and yes we just passed the test so get at get commit is zero raises an exception if its input is not a number well is not is of the incorrect type is of the incorrect is of the incorrect type so this is the blue phase i'm gonna push it uh, and then it should be on github uh, let's take a look is he raises should be raises an exception if its input is of an incorrect type that's great so maybe you think I'm done here that is false so what you may be not um, this so so you may think that this is a brilliant job but I'm gonna add a function that fails still this one assert is 0 0.0.0, .0, .0. we all agree that 0, .0, 0 is equal to 0 um, so we're gonna run it again so I'm going to break the code on purposely because I know that this is a loophole. This is uh, something that's overlooked. The problem is here is that x must be of type int. So the input is tested to be of type int only. Uh, but this is a float and the float can also be zero. So the error message should be must be of type int or float. And what we're going to do, we're going to use the word, we're going to use this as a tuple, tuple notation. And because we just broke the code, now we're fixing it. We were in the green phase. And let's take a look. Everything passes now. So gonna get add commit push, get add commit raise if its type is of incorrect type. Um, is zero works on floats, floats as well. So this was the green phase. I uploaded my code. I'm going to refresh it here. And we're going to see that I've just uploaded uh, my new code. So now it's time to break the code again. Well, that's. I think we can't break it anymore. We can try if we want. For example, is, is, is not 0, 42. For example, 42 is not a... Uh, it's not a num it's not zero, but this passes, so we should delete that test as well. So I predict I can't break is zero anymore. It does exactly what it says. Um so I'm done here. So that brings me to the last part of this video. I'm gonna view the commit history. Because if you do TDD as like methodological like I just did, um then if you take a look at your file you'll see a pretty pattern so I just clicked on s0.py in my github repository and here's the full code again and we're gonna click on blame so blame or sometimes called praise because some people feel blame is a bit too negative if you take a look at blame you should see that there are one two three tests so each test should be in and you can see all the modifications here. So first we have the documentation. Works on floats as well. Returns to. So you see that there are different commit messages all the time. Because TDD should be done in small cycles. So each test is one cycle. So that's why each test should have its own different commit message. And the commit message should should be um, 
should be similar to, to, to the code what is it is about. Ideally, it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one translation, which is more or less the case here. Right. That concludes my video on how to do TDD on a very trivial function in Python using a GitHub repository and then viewing the commit history. I was Richard Bilderbeek and I'm going to wish you a very good day. Bye!